Good evening. Welcome to Triton College's virtual lecture recital series. My name is Salvatore Siriano. I'm the lead music instructor at Triton College. Thank you for joining us this evening. I wanna let everyone know we are recording this event. This is a webinar, so your video will always be off. If you have any questions for our presenter, you can type them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. You will also have time near the end of the program to ask questions. Tonight, I am happy to introduce you to the artistic director of an organization I was kindly introduced to by Triton's president, Mary Rita Moore. Alex Yaffe, artistic director of Friends of the Gamelan, is a Javanese gamelan musician and teacher. After completing his degree in music composition at the Chicago College of Performing Arts, my alma mater, he went on to the concentrated study of central Javanese gamelan, having been awarded a scholarship fully funded by the Indonesian government at the Indonesian Institute of the Arts in Surakarta, Yafi has performed with and taught many gamelans across the United States, as well as numerous universities and colleges. He has also performed with many groups and renowned musicians in Java, Indonesia. It is my pleasure to present you to this evening, Alex Yafi. Alex, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about Javanese gamelan today. So this is going to be music from Indonesia and specifically from the island of Java. So I'd like to start by just showing a map of Indonesia just so we can have an idea of where I'm talking about. So I'm going to share my screen for a second and share a map of Indonesia. So here we have Indonesia and there's actually 17,000 islands actually probably a little bit over that. Um, but we're talking about music specifically from Java. So as you can see, this is the island of Java right here. The capital is Jakarta. Many of you have probably heard of Jakarta. Um, and right next to Java, this little tiny island here is actually Bali. And probably some of you have heard of Bali. It's a, a really popular um, tourist destination spot, vacation spot. Indonesia here, as you can see, um, is just underneath Malaysia and, and mainland uh, Southeast Asia. And then just a little bit below it, we have Australia. So that's the location of where Indonesia is. Um, there are many different types of gamelan. So gamelan is not specific to just the island of Java. Um, there's also gamelan uh, that's very popular is in Bali as well. It's a different kind of gamelan. And even within the island of Java, there are many different regional styles that have different ensembles, different sounds, different playing styles. Um, so we're mainly going to be talking about central Javanese gamelan. So if you can see here, this little dot, uh, Jogjakarta, this is central Java. And the style that we're talking about comes from both Jogjakarta as well as Surakarta, which would be just next to Jogjakarta, although it doesn't show it on this map. So before I, talk about this music in any way, I'd like us to watch just a short clip of an ensemble playing a traditional piece. So we can just kind of absorb what's going on. And then after we're done watching a few minutes of it, I'll, I'll ask you to just uh, point out just a few things that you notice about the music, some basic qualities that stick out to you. So I'm gonna share my screen once again, and I'm gonna play just a few minutes of this ensemble in Indonesia, in, in Java, playing a traditional piece. The piece is called Walujang. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. So I'd love it if a few people wouldn't mind sharing their thoughts, their experience on, on watching that video. Just, just some, some thoughts that came to mind, some observations about what you saw. If I can just interject real quick, feel free to type in, in either in the chat box or if you have questions in the Q&A section, or if you'd like to share something, just raise your hand and I will unmute your mic and we know we welcome you all to speak. So whatever way you're most comfortable with, we'd love to hear from you. Let's see, okay, we saw from Sarah, xylophone-like instrument and percussion really tie everything together. Yeah, so there's a lot of different xylophone instruments that they have. Some of them look identical and some of them have a little bit different shapes and sizes, amounts of keys. And not everything that we saw, but a lot of what we saw was percussion-based instruments. That's a really great observation. Anyone else? We do have Charlie, um, so I'm going to allow Charlie to ask the question. Great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just kind of like the whole look of the ensemble. It looked pretty laid back. Like I'm sure it's very complex and very difficult things they're doing, but like compared to kind of ensembles we have here, it looks like looks like it's just less strict. You know what I mean? That's that's a really good observation as well. So. When we're thinking about like performance etiquette, culturally it's different in, in Java. When, when we think about it here, if, if you go to you know, a music recital or something, everyone sits down in their seats and the audience is very quiet. And you know, anyone that coughs gets like a stink eye or something like that, right? Um, and just in general, when you're on stage, you know, there, there's an element of being a performer, right? And you're performing for an audience. Whereas in Java, the performers, the, the musicians, they don't think of themselves as performing for an audience. They're playing for themselves. So it is much more laid back in that sense. You do have audiences and there, there are a lot of different contexts that this music exists in. Um, one of which is, is music just for the sake of music, but it also exists for dance as well as shadow puppet performances and other theater kind of performances. So it's accompanied for those things. It's played on its own, but in general, the, the vibe is, is much more relaxed in that sense. So that, that's a really good point. So I'm gonna break down this ensemble of what we just saw instrument by instrument. I'm not gonna get to every single instrument um, that we saw, but I'll get to the majority of them so we can talk about the different families of instruments and understand how this music is kind of working together, what's going on, because we probably heard a lot of different sounds. And maybe for some people, it sounded like a sort of more of like a wash of sound and you couldn't really distinctly pick out every single thing that was going on. But once you start to understand how each instrument functions, you're able to really hear what they're doing, how they're interacting with each other, what they're contributing to the music. So the first set of instruments that I'm gonna introduce is a set of instruments, uh, they're xylophone instruments um, and they're called the balungan, which means skeleton in Indonesian. So they're the, they play the skeletal melody. Let's take a look. I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to watch a video. The first instrument, so I'll only show one instrument from, from this um, collection. It's called the saran. There's another instrument called the dumung, which is an octave lower another one an octave lower than that called the slentum, and one an octave higher than the saran called the peking. They all play in unison with each other, the skeletal melody. So this is what the saran sounds like, and it's demonstrated by um, Pak Sumarsam, who actually directs the gamelan, or he co-directs the gamelan at Yale University along with Pak Harjito. So this is, this is part of the way in collection. Wesleyan and Yale, actually. He's at Wesleyan and Yale, both in Connecticut. So please enjoy. This is the Sauron instrument, skeletal melody.
So as you can see, we have these different keys and he's striking the key with a mallet and we call it a tabu. Um, but in order for it to sound nice, you'll notice that his other hand that's not holding the mallet is actually being used to dampen the previous key. So this is, this is a technique that, that all of the musicians will use in order to prevent the keys from bleeding into each other and, and sounding too washy. So he's dampening. It's kind of like a brain game where he has to hit, he has to hit one key and then as soon as he hits the next key, he needs to at the same time dampen the previous key. So this is the playing technique for Sauron. And do we have a, ah, what does the instrument look like? Are you able to, to see the uh, video? Right now we see a zoom, it's just like it says zoom screen on it. Just zoom screen, oh. Were you able to hear the sound though, the audio sound? Yes, yes, we heard we heard the melody. We just it just was kind of a blank screen. Let's try that again. Ah, are you able to see now? Yes. Okay, great. Let's just watch a tiny clip of that again. So you can see his other hand is, is dampening. So this is the Sauron. This is part of the skeletal melody family of instruments. So next, we're going to take a look at the structural instruments, the instruments are, that are punctuating important moments within the form. So we'll take a look at the compools. So these are like the hanging gongs that, that you saw in that first video. And these are used to just sort of punctuate important moments in the form, in the structure, the phrasing, right? So we have a little phrase and then it's punctuated by the compools. Let's see what they sound like. So as you can hear, they're all individually pitched and their pitches will match the pitches of the ensemble, what the ensemble is tuned to. So not only is it punctuating in the form, it's also accenting melodically as well. It's complementing the pitches that are played in the ensemble. Another punctuating instrument, structural instrument, the, the ethnomusicology term used is kalatomic, kalatomic instrument uh, would be the kanong. So these are um, pot gongs, but they have a very similar function to the kampool where they're punctuating. Although usually the kampools and the kanongs will sort of alternate in, in their punctuations.
So those are the canongs and the little um, pot gongs that you see on the left side of the screen is actually the Ketuk and Kempyang. So the Ketuk and Kempyang, another punctuating instrument, but it's, it's used as a rhythmic punctuating instrument. So depending on the form, it plays a specific rhythm, whereas the pitches are not as important. However, with the Kanongs, you notice that they also have specific pitches that they're tuned to. So they complement melodically as well as structurally. So, so far, the two families of instruments that we've looked at have been the skeletal melody instruments like the sauron that we saw, as well as all of the other similar looking instruments in their own respective octaves. And then we have the structural instruments that punctuate important moments within that skeletal melody within the form. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of the largest gong, but if you can imagine the compools, the, um, the hanging gongs that we saw in the previous video, there is a very, very large looking one and that's the biggest gong. So that big gong is striking only at the end of cycles. So when you get to the very end, you play the big gong and then you go back to the beginning or you go on to something else. So it's always completing the cycle. And within that cycle, within that form, we have the kanongs and we have the kampools punctuating moments within the phrasing. But now, we have another family of instruments that will elaborate or, or ornament around the skeletal melody. So they typically play busier. They're filling in the space where you have this skeleton, right? Within inside the skeleton, you have all this extra stuff going on. So let's take a look at a few of those instruments so we can hear how they sound. The first instrument that we'll take a look at is called the bonang. It looks like this. And there's actually two bonangs. There's a bonang barung, which is the lower octave instrument, and a bonang panarus, which is a higher octave instrument. I think Pat Sumarsam is demonstrating the bonang barung, but they work together in the sense that the bonang barung will play typically half as fast and the panarus will play twice as fast, but they create like an interlocking rhythm with each other. Sometimes they literally interlock where one is playing at one moment, the other is playing at the next moment, creating like one overall texture, but you have to have two people playing it in order to create that texture. So let's listen to the bonang. So playing a little bit busier, it's going to be filling in the space. Now, all the instruments that we've seen Pat Sumarsam demonstrate, he's actually playing a melody to a specific song. And that specific song is Walujang, which is the song that we saw that full ensemble playing at the very beginning uh, of this. So eventually we comes back together and how it's all fitting in. So we're, we're actually watching the individual parts of that song. Uh, if at any point in time anyone has a question about something that they're, they're seeing, um, please feel free to, to write into the chat. I'd be happy to answer. I know we're going to go over quite a lot of material, so feel free to ask away. Uh, the next instrument that we're going to take a look at is called the gambang. Gambang is a wooden instrument. So, so far we've only seen instruments made out of metal. So this is an instrument made out of wood, um, and it's played with two mallets, so both hands are being used. Typically it's played in octaves, uh, although sometimes there's a little bit of elaboration that, that's a little bit fancier than that. Um, but again, it's another elaborating instrument. So it's playing, it's ornamenting around the skeletal melody. So let's take a look at the gambang. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that was the gambang. As you can see, it has a larger register than the bonang even, which is you know the other elaborating instrument that we saw. It has more keys on it, so it can actually express uh, more notes, a higher register, lower register. It ha it's able to express more. Um, the next instrument that we're going to take a look at is called the suling. Suling is a flute that's made out of bamboo. Now, the suling is a very interesting instrument. It's elaborating, but it's actually meant to imitate the vocal qualities of the solo female vocalist. So it actually plays unmetered. It's not rhythmically you know, specific. So it's a little bit loose in that sense. And, and you may be able to hear that in the full ensemble recording later, but this is how the suling sounds on its own. That was the suling. You'll notice that Paksu Marsam is playing all these instruments. So this is another interesting quality about Javanese gamelan music is that unlike you think of a Western orchestra, right? You have one person who plays the violin, you have one person who plays, you know, one of the percussion instruments, one person who plays the trombone, but they don't know the other instruments. They don't know how to play the other instruments, right? The violinist doesn't also play trombone and trumpet and cello and all of that. Whereas with Javanese gamelan, as a musician, you're expected to know how to play all the instruments. Uh, and that actually strengthens your understanding of the music and your ability to sort of respond in moments to various things because the music itself is slightly improvisatory. It's not fixed. So you can play, you can look up a hundred different recordings of Wulujung, this piece that we're kind of exploring today. You can look them up on YouTube and every single recording they'll treat it a little bit different. It may sound similar, it may sound quite different, um, but each time it'll be totally its own thing. Um, another instrument that we're gonna look at, I think I just have two or three more instruments and, and then we'll um, look into more of larger ensembles. So the next instrument, which is one of my favorites, is the gender. So this instrument, we can see that it has metal keys and they're suspended over two resonators. It's also gonna be played with two mallets. Um, although because it's metal and it has the, the two resonators, it's going to um, sustain for a long time, just like the Sauron that we saw. And we noticed that when we were watching the Sauron, Patsumarsam was dampening with his left hand in order to prevent the sound from getting too washy. Whereas this, He's playing with both hands. So the dampening technique is gonna be much more complicated. He's gonna be using bits of his hand and his thumb to sort of dampen the keys because you still have the same idea where you, when you hit the next key, you dampen the previous one. So it's a little more complicated, but it creates a really, really beautiful sound. So please enjoy the Gendare. <laughs> So that is the gender. Next we have the rabab. Now this is sort of like a violin. It's, it's a bowed fiddle instrument. And this instrument also is not completely 
doesn't play completely rhythmically in time. It's a little bit loose. And again, it's sort of imitating the vocal quality of, of the singing in this music. Um, but it also leads the ensemble. It cues the ensemble for specific things. So the ensemble has to be listening very closely to this instrument because the instrument, the player, will signal certain things and the ensemble has to respond and change what they're doing in those moments. So here's the rabab. So that's the rabab. Now the last instrument that I wanna show all of you is the kendang, which is basically the hand drums. Now this instrument sits outside of these three families that we've talked about. So we've talked about the skeletal melody instruments, we've talked about the structural or collatomic instruments, and we've talked about the elaborating instruments. Now the kendang, the drummer, acts it's like multifaceted. So it acts as a structural instrument in the sense that it plays specific patterns based on the structure of the piece. Uh, it also acts as an elaborating instrument where it can play highly elaborative patterns that it's filling in uh, within the skeletal melody. And it also acts as the conductor of the ensemble. So the, the kendang player will slow down, speed up, um, do various uh, cues that it's going to tell the ensemble, okay, we're ending the piece, oh, we're moving on, oh, we're doing this type of treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So it's literally acting as the conductor. There's no one in the ensemble who's just sort of conducting like you would think in, in, in a Western orchestra context, right? This, this is uh, the conductor of the ensemble for, for Javanese gamelan. So here's the kendang. <laughs> So we can see there's a lot of different sounds you can get out of this drum. They're all very, very specific. So now that we have sort of a familiarity with a lot of these instruments, I'd like us to watch a video now of Wulu Jung, but it's just going to be the um, it's just going to be the balungan or skeletal melody instruments, and then the structural instruments are going to join in. So that way we can hear the skeletal melody on its own played by all of the Balungan instruments in unison together. And then we'll hear the structure join in so we can hear how it punctuates the skeletal melody. After that, I'll have us go back to that original video and we can listen again to the full ensemble play this very same piece and we can hear everything collectively together. notice that some of the instruments are lower sounding than the others. They're all playing in their own octaves, but they're playing the exact same melody together.
All right. So hopefully the uh, big gong cut through enough on that recording so you could hear that wow, 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 wow. Uh, that's a very cool sound. And that was marking the end of the uh, structure. Um, so now we heard how, how the structure and the uh, skeletal instruments or the skeletal melody instruments are interacting with each other. I see that we have a few questions, a uh, really good one. So um, let's see. There seem to be no women playing instruments. Are women restricted from playing instruments? This is a really good question. So traditionally, um, the women would be the vocalists and the men would be playing the instruments. Um, and men would also sing a separate vocal melody, um, totally different from, from the women. However, um, there are plenty of, of ensembles now uh, that are all female or have females um, playing alongside men. Although uh, culturally, uh, for a professional musician level, it's still more in the sense that women um, are the vocalists professionally for professional gigs and, and men are the instrumentalists. That's a really good question. Um, and I can say that I've heard a lot of women who play those instruments way better than a lot of the men sometimes. So let's take a look back at this original video now. Now we have a really good idea of how this ensemble works. We've got the skeletal melody, we've got the structure and the elaborating instruments, and now we're going to hear the, the vocals as well. So you'll notice the, uh, there's a solo female vocalist that's singing slightly unmetered, and then a male vocalist will sing a separate melody that's um, metered. So let's listen to Willu Jiang. So now we can hear everything together. And, and also on a side note, um, there's a lot of um, female performers in this as well that are playing the instruments in this video. Um, they're all wearing yellow, um, playing some of the, the Sauron instruments. And it looks like one might be playing, or both of them might be playing the Bonang instruments, the elaborating instruments as well. Uh, and you can see this video was clearly shot um, during the uh, pandemic since everyone is wearing a face mask. Um, so we can hear how all these elaborating instruments are playing together 
they're supporting this fixed skeletal melody, but they're all kind of elaborating slightly different in their own ways while complementing the notes at the same time. So it creates this really rich, dense texture. And it's also an opportunity for each musician to sort of express themselves uh, in their own way as their patterns that they're playing are not 100% fixed. It's, it's sort of similar to jazz in a way where you, you have you know, something specific that you have to do, but then you can kind of deviate from it a little bit as long as you're being very musical about it. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So, so far, everything that we've heard has been in one tuning. This is the Slendro tuning, which is a, a five note tuning system, very similar to if you were to play like the black keys on the piano each each uh, pitch is equally apart from the previous pitch. Um, but uh, in Japanese gamelan, they also use another tuning system called pelag, which is a seven note tuning system. And it sounds a little bit funkier. Um, the, the pitches aren't all equal from each other. Some are, and I hesitate to use this word, but some are kind of like half steps and some are kind of like whole steps, uh, steps and a half, kind of, you know, obviously it's not exactly the Western tuning that we're used to. Um, but this next video that I'm gonna show is in the Pelog tuning. Um, before I go into the video though, what we just saw was a group performing Wilujung, this piece on its own. Uh, there was no other context other than just to play the music for itself. However, in Indonesia and in Java specifically, uh, gamelan music is also used really heavily to accompany dance as well as shadow puppet performances called Wayang Kulit, um, which are both really, really popular uh, in, in Java. And Java is primarily uh, Muslim. So it's this really interesting sort of history with religion in Indonesia, because originally they were animists and then uh, Hinduism came along and that was very big there. And then Islam came later. And so in Java and the way that gamelan music works is they actually still have little bits of everything. So from the animist side, they believe that um, spirits inhabit with inside the instruments and that the instruments are alive. And so as a result, you'll see that people are never wearing their shoes. They're never stepping directly over the instruments. They're stepping around them. And that's out of respect for the spirits that are inside the instruments. If you were to step over an instrument, you know, uh, it's very auspicious, right? Something, maybe something unfortunate will happen to you later in the day. I don't know. So there's that side. Um, but then they still, even though they're, uh, it's mainly Islam now in, in Java, most of the dance repertoire, the stories that are being told in the dances and the stories that are being told in the, in the Wayang, the shadow puppet performances, these are all coming from the Hindu epics, like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So these stories are coming from Hinduism. And sometimes they're even performing these for Islamic holidays. So you have an Islamic holiday being celebrated with a Hindu story happening, playing on instruments um, that have, you know, these ties to, to animism as well. So it's very interesting. Um, so let's take a look. This is a very famous dance that I'm about to show you called Tari Klono. We're not going to watch the whole thing because it's a long video, but I just want to give you an idea. So a few things that we're going to notice differently. First is the tuning. It's going to be Pelog tuning. So the instruments, the whole ensemble is going to sound different. Um, secondly, we're going to see a dancer on stage. So now the ensemble is going to be reacting to the dancer. The dance is not fixed. It's impro improvised slightly. Uh, so the drummer especially is going to be mimicking a lot of the movements of the dancer. Uh, and they don't necessarily know exactly what they're going to do ahead of time. So you have to watch very closely and really have, have a mastery of, of, of your instrument in order to do something like this. So please enjoy Tari Klono.
fun so i always hate stopping it because it's just so cool um so that's an example of dance in gamelan although that's certainly not the only example of of dance um this is the gaga style or, or the bombastic male style of dance um but there's also an androgynous style which um uh, it's a little bit more refined it can be danced by either a male or a female and then there's also the uh, refined, very refined female style, um, which is typically danced only by, by females. Um, so unfortunately, I think we need to move on. Although maybe I'll just show you a very short, very short clip of, of some of the female style. This is, this is a palace style dance. It's extremely refined and it looks like the dancers aren't moving, but um, or aren't moving very much, but it's actually extremely strenuous because every single movement that they make with their feet, with their hands, with their shoulders, with their, with their elbows, everything is extremely specific and has to be at the perfect angle. It can't be higher, can't be lower. It's very strenuous. Um, so I'll just kind of um, fast forward a little bit through this so we can get a few different clips of it. Mm -hmm. 
So this is an example of one of the most refined styles of dance. And it not only is it difficult to do in short periods of time, but typically these dances are like 45 minutes long, as you probably can see from this video. Uh, so that it's a very long dance. <laughs> uh, let's see. Are women restricted from playing? Oh, wait, sorry. We already saw that. All the movements are very defined and purposeful, which really adds the beauty. Yes, extremely. I'm so glad you noticed that. Yes, everything is very distinctive. And, and I have spent a lot of time at the palace accompanying these dancers and hearing during rehearsals, hearing, you know, the teacher yelling at them, no, it's, your, your elbow's too high, lower it over and over again. Yes, I can send this YouTube link. Let's see, I'll put this in the chat here. Is the YouTube link. Okay, so the last thing I'd like to show you guys is an example of the shadow puppet performances, because these happen all the time for so many different um, life events. You know, when someone's getting married, you have to have a Wayang Kulit shadow puppet performance. Um, you know, when someone dies, you have a Wayang Kulit performance. Uh, when it's someone's birthday, you have a Wayang Kulit performance. It's just always happening. And these shadow puppet performance are typically seven or eight hours long. They start at about eight o'clock at night and they go until sunrise. So these musicians are playing all night long without a rest. And the puppeteer especially is has to not only be an expert musician because the puppeteer has to know all the music because he's cueing it. He has to know all these stories um, and tell them very well. He needs to be virtuosic with his, his um, puppet control because he's making the puppets move on, on this stage. Um, he's going to be singing, and he's also going to be giving rhythmic cues from, from tapping on a box with, with metal sheets to the ensemble. And he needs to know about four different languages, because depending on the characters in the story, they're all going to be speaking in different languages. So it, it's very, very, very difficult stuff. Um, and this Dalang is... Um, one of the most famous Dalang, so Kikesdik. So please enjoy just a little bit. Again, I'm gonna skip around a little bit since we're short on time, just so you can get an idea. Uh, let's see. Is this, can everyone see this video? It's gonna be a little blurry. All right. <laughs> Mundur sangin yo mantri Undangin prometyo So right now he's singing Sangyo sawe bo 
setting the stage. Ulung umurus waraning pendebari, kupar kunang gawa. He's using this moment to introduce various characters onto the screen to set the scene. I think we're just about out of time. Is, is that correct? Just about. I mean, you're, you're welcome to go on for a few more minutes, so by, by sure. no means. 
Um, well, that's a very cool scene. Um, but I, I noticed that there were some comments. Um, these are shadow puppets. You're behind the stage. The audience just sees the shadows. That's a really good observation. So we have this stage and there's a light that's casting on it, right, to create the shadow. And we have the puppeteer behind it. We also have the gamelan on the puppeteer's side, right, so that the gamelan can see what the puppeteer is doing. Well, we have all these really nice designs on all the puppets as well. So I think a long time ago, the majority of the audience was on the shadow side where they were only seeing the shadows. But now, more often than not, the majority of the audience is on the side where the puppeteer is with the musicians. Uh, and I think it's because they, they have such a deep appreciation for everything that goes into it. They're, they're more interested in seeing what the puppeteer is doing and what the gamelan is doing more so than just sitting back and seeing the shadows. Although there certainly are plenty of people who are on the shadow side as well. It's just, I would say more often than not, the majority of the audience is actually on the side where we can see the puppeteer. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to dissect in all of this. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions about anything that we've talked about or seen so far. Okay, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand and I will uh, be happy to unmute your microphone. Uh, how did you get into all of this? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, so I, well, I've always been uh, very interested in music and, and exploring different kinds of music. I got really into music composition. I actually went and studied music composition at Roosevelt. And so I think just being a, a composer, someone interested in, in how music is composed, I was always looking for all different examples of, of how to approach music. And I started getting into a lot of different world musics and, and I stumbled upon uh, gamelan music and it really intrigued me. And then I found out that there was an ensemble that I could play with. I started playing with them. And then uh, before I knew it, I was in Java studying and getting really crazy about it. <laughs> um, next question, how popular is this with younger people? That's a really good question too. Uh, so gamelan music, I think is in a, a similar boat to how classical music is nowadays where the younger generation, it's a little bit less appreciative of, of the music than it is for some of the older generation. Um, although still very much so, there's, there's a lot of young people who are learning to play this music. Um, often they come from families, right? So traditionally, if, if your father or mother was, was a, a gamelan musician of some kind, you would also probably be doing that as well. And that still holds true a lot today. Uh, although there are plenty of examples of people who came from a family that didn't have any kind of gamelan background um, and got in, in, involved in the music as well. But yeah, you know, the, the, the younger people, they're, they're interested, you know, in, in Western music, they're interested in, in hip hop and, and all of that. There's actually a really huge heavy metal scene in Indonesia. And I don't mean the heavy metal that's used for gamelan, right? Literal heavy metal. <laughs> um, but the heavy metal music style. They're, they're really into that. Um, so yeah, you definitely see a, a slight decline uh, in interest from the younger generations, um, but it's still there. Next question, are the performances conducted by a conductor? Good question. So when I was talking about the kendang, the drummer before, the drummer is the conductor of, of the ensemble. So there's no one literally going up and waving their hands around for the ensemble. It's actually the drummer communicating all of those same things just with, with um, the notes that, and the sounds that the drummer's making, the tempos and all of that. So the drummer is cueing the ensemble for various things without having to say or, or having to, to wave their hands. It's, it's being done all simply through the sounds of the instruments. Um, next question, since it is a Muslim country, do they still pray before a performance? Yeah, there's, it, you know, it, it depends because um, there's, there's performers, you know, plenty of performers are, are Muslim, there's Christian, Hindu, all of that. It all exists there. Um, but yeah, you'll see typically before a performance, like an official performance, or if you're having a large gathering for like a rehearsal or something like that, you're going to make an offering to the instruments, which is usually, you know, some fruit. Um, and some incense will be burned. You leave that near the biggest gong, making an offering to them. Um, and then there'll be a little prayer that'll be said 
um, before the rehearsal begins or before the performance begins. We have a question Q and A. Ah. Hey, Rut. Um, I'm not sure. It says anonymous. Possible rewatch. Um, I'm not sure which one, which uh, particular video clip you were referring to that you would like to receive. If if you let us know in the chat, we can probably send you the link um, so that you can you can rewatch that one again. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. I think we'll, we have one more question, and then we'll we'll let Alex go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to stay for a few minutes. Okay, if, sounds uh, good. There's more questions. Um, let's see. Are instruments mass produced or handmade? That's another really excellent question. Um, they are handmade. Everything is 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 handmade, and you actually you can't have your own. Let's say sauron right you you have your own sauron you can't take that to some gamelan group down the street and play it with them because the tuning won't be the same so as an ensemble each ensemble has a slendro tuning and a pelog tuning but the starting pitch totally varies based on who made the instruments and and how the instruments were made collectively so there is no like a440 right so someone will make an entire set of instruments all together that'll all be in tune with themselves, but the starting pitch that they, that they made for that is gonna be different from the set down the street, which collectively they're all in tune with themselves, but the pitches might not match gamelan A to gamelan B. Um, and it's actually, the instrument making is considered an, an art form in itself. You have a gamelan maker, they have to be well-known, reputable. Typically, often they're not even the musicians. They don't, they don't play the music, but they just make the instruments. That's, that's what they do. It's their craft. It's an art form. Um, it's very difficult. There's plenty of gamelan makers who make instruments and, and they get a bad reputation because the tuning isn't nice or um, it, doesn't, it doesn't suit the, the ears of the musicians who, who play on them. Um, next question. I'm wondering about scales. I've heard that gamelan uses five-tone scale or seven-tone scale. I found a gamelan-looking instrument but with only six keys, must it be from a different country, music tradition, since it's got a wrong set of keys? Um, I don't know specifically. It could be a gamelan instrument, because even if it has five tones, which would be the slendro scale, or seven tones, which would be the pelog scale, there are plenty of instruments that have more keys and, and less keys than that. So even a slendro instrument, um, like the sauron, which is the most basic one, it's, it's a five tone scale, but it has seven keys on it. It just has an extra octave of, of two notes. Um, and originally there weren't seven keys on Slendro. There were six and even five. So it very well could be that you have that. Um, is there any type of restrictions in this culture when it comes to music? Um, that's a good question. It, it depends on where you, where you live. Um, so there's certain regions that are very, very strict. Um, there's, there's a few regions that, that follow Sharia law and they don't allow um, females to perform on stage, um, even if it's like a female role. So like a, a man will, will dress up um, or, you know, will take over the, the vocal aspect of it and, and will even dress to look like the, the female outfit for, for the vocalist. Um, but there's majority, it's, it's, it's much more liberal than that, especially in the cities that I was talking about, like Surakarta and Jogjakarta, where the central Japanese gamelan music is, is mainly heard. Um, there's not very many restrictions. Um, I'm happy to take a few more questions if anyone has any more questions. Any other questions? Oh, let me see here. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll address that one there. That's just about broadcast. Um, I do have one question and then we'll, um, since studying this music and being a composer yourself, how is it studying a whole different tonal system based completely on a different aesthetic um, affected your own composition, your own writing? When <laughs> That's a good question. Um... 
I, I mean, it's affected it heavily. Um, I don't do as much composing of my own these days because I'm just so busy with gamelan music. I have written for gamelan ensembles in the past, and I've incorporated a lot of gamelan elements uh, into my compositions in the past, whether it literally be instruments or just sort of the, the theoretical concepts, um, some of which we talked about today. Um, but I was actually lucky enough where when I was getting into gamelan music, I was simultaneously studying Western classical music. So I was taking, you know, all the, the ear training classes and, and all of that, the dictation classes with Western music and, and, and really having simultaneously learning and, and familiarizing myself with the gamelan pitches. So I kind of like had both at the same time, which I think was a little bit easier for me to kind of be able to work with each of them independently as, as well as together and not, not get too confused. <laughs> um, uh, one more question. Uh, what's the main difference between Javanese and other types of gamelan music? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know how well I can answer it in this short time, um, but the two most popular kinds of gamelan music, there's Javanese and then there's Balinese. And if you go and just type in Balinese gamelan music into YouTube, you'll get a lot of examples. Something that you'll notice is the, the instruments and the tuning sound and look really similar. The playing styles are very different. Balinese gamelan is very, very fast and energetic and virtuosic in the sense that musicians are just playing at really, really high speeds all the time. Um, however, uh, they don't have as much room for all the dense textures and dense, uh, complicated um, interaction between the instruments as Javanese do, you know, with all the elaborating instruments that we saw, everything that's sort of filling in. So that'll be something that you'll notice. Um, but there are plenty of other examples as well. So you can, you can explore on YouTube. Okay, any final questions before we conclude this evening? I think we have one more. Is the suling popular in meditation music or does it also branch out in other pieces of music? What do, do you mean meditation music in Indonesia or just in general? Um, usually in general. Okay, yeah, probably for, for um, music that's sort of borrowing from ideas of, of, of gamelan and uh, the suling is probably popular. I think when, when you kind of go to like the more touristy areas of, of like Bali and stuff, and you kind of go to like sort of the spa areas, they have a lot of music that's heavily focused on the suling to sort of relax you and all of that. Um, although it originally comes from gamelan music, right? Which is, it's not, gamelan music is not necessarily meant to be meditative in that way. Okay. Well, I think we will um, we will conclude our presentation. So um, I want to thank you, Alex, for a wonderful program. Uh, we hope to have you on campus for a workshop when it's safe to do so. Uh, but yes. happy we were able to uh, connect this way virtually and in the time being, you know, as, as we hopefully find our way to the end of the pandemic much sooner rather than later. Um, I would also like to thank President Mary Rita Moore Vice President, Dr. Susan Campos, uh, Associate Vice President, Interim Dean of Arts and Sciences, Paul Jensen, Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences, Derek Salinas Lazarski, and our VPC Department Chairperson, Dennis McNamara, for their support in implementing this virtual series. Our next event is Wednesday, October 27th. Aztec Stories creator, Michael Geraldo will present his Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead program. Join us to develop a deeper understanding and appreciation of this annual ceremony. Thank you again for attending. Stay safe and we hope to see you again very soon. Uh, I sent the links uh, to the Friends of the Gamelon website so you can uh, keep up to date with events that are going on through Alex's organization. Uh, and then also please continue to check Triton's website for the next virtual events we have coming up as well. So Alex, thank you again. Everyone take care and good night. Thank, thank you so much. I'd like to just say one quick yes, thing. Absolutely. Just, just a little pitch. Uh, first of all, thank you so yes. much for having me. Um, but pitch. we. We do have one very big um, event coming up on October 16th. Um, 
in Chicago, we have an in-person performance at Epiphany Center for the Arts at 3 p.m. Saturday, October 16th. You can go to our website or you can go to Epiphany's website um, to find out more. Epiphany's website has the tickets for sale. Um, everyone has to be vaccinated in order to attend the event and masks need to be worn at all times. We're gonna have guests from Indonesia joining us for this event to perform with us. It's gonna be really, really, really cool. So. I hope uh, if you feel comfortable that you, that you will join and check it out. Alex, if you could send me an email, then I will send a, I will send the information to all everyone who attended this evening. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Everybody have a great night. Stay safe.